Okay, you guys. Thanks so much for coming. Um, super appreciate it. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Uh, on behalf of Scott Goldstein, the captain of Pikesville, I welcome you to the Pikesville training space. My name is Sean Barinholtz. I'm a, a, a volunteer here at Pikesville, uh, and I'm an anesthesiologist and critical care physician at Hopkins. Um, I work with the medical director's office with uh, Andy Pollack. Uh, Dave Wittberg and Jeff Sagel were very committed to developing EMS training opportunities. Uh, this is a Monday night lecture series. If you have ideas on how to get this word out, I hope that you're on our email list. Uh, how to better spread this throughout the volunteer and career system. Uh, I, we welcome ideas. Uh, there is a sign-in sheet. The sign-in sheet uh, we'll send around. I just ask you if you want to get MIM CEUs for this, I'm happy to process that. Uh, I do need to have your name accurately as it would have been registered with MIMS, for example. So it's amazing to me how many times people are signing in and I can't find you in the MIMS system. So either it's not the same formal name or if you have your MIMS number, uh, on each of the sides, there are two columns to write in your MIMS number. That would be amazing. It would help me assure that you get your MIMS CEUs. When these are done, they'll also be recorded. They'll be available uh, via recording on the, wet, on, um, on the cloud. Uh, I have a Dropbox space for these. So I'll send out the link to this presentation as well, so feel free to use this for your own training, for example. If you can't do them on Monday nights, for example, within your own company, if you want to do them as another night, uh, feel free to use these trainings uh, to try to spread those. So again, thanks so much uh, for coming and for your time. Uh, today, I'm uh, super grateful to Nikki Austin. Uh, Nikki really shepherded this when we have been, Nikki's been helping a lot with the EMS lecture series and pulling this together and she said, I have this great idea. I want to bring my faculty and my colleagues from Towson uh, nursing and do some simulations around OB. I know how much time it takes to organize this. Um, so I'm very just so grateful uh, for that. Nikki Austin is an associate professor, adult health nursing at Towson University. She's nationally certified in emergency nursing and nursing education. She's also an EMT, uh, uh, rides here at Pikesville, and she's an amazing educator. So Nikki, thanks for that. Uh, Adrian Burgess, right? Uh, Adrian is an assistant professor of obstetric nursing at Towson University. Adrian is nationally certified in OB, in nursing education. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise. Uh, traveling from Pennsylvania. Can tell you just a little bit about um, what it takes to be able to do this just because we're really thrilled that you're all here I'm going to take like two seconds um, we're happy to share simulation with you we have an um, entire floor of simulation mannequins we have a whole little pediatric unit with all different uh, sizes of patients um, this is the first time that we've taken um, Sarah on the road um, uh, later um, so, um, so just to be able to set this up, it's taken about two and a half hours. So thank you to Tara. She's been here since about uh, 4.30 uh, trying to get her connected and work. So we've never done this before. So we ask for your patience and how we do this. We have another mannequin lying out on the red floor waiting to cause us some problems later. So we actually have two patients, and we weren't sure how many people were going to show up. So, um, so we're going we're gonna to wing it with the, uh, the practical part. Our other OB instructor, Heidi Stone, is ill, so she's not able to be with us today. So we're short one OB instructor. And the message for you all is, um, if you're not an OB person, call your friend. So I called my friends to do this. I'm just going to turn this over to Adrian right now, who's our OB expert. Here. Can I hook this on myself? I'm going to hold it. <coughs> Thank you. 
talking because I can't talk. You know, you did have uh, training um, information on OB, but sometimes it's just kind of glossed over or goes over very quickly. So,
Oh, I'm being hooked back up again. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I think of the amniotic sac like a big bobber balloon, okay? And the baby's in there. At term, the baby is encased with about two liters of amniotic fluid. The baby is getting all of its nutrients from the placenta. So the placenta at term is, weighs about a pound and it's coming from the placenta through the umbilical cord to the baby. So all that's going on in there. Now, with this growing uterus or gravid uterus, it's weighing a lot. You have an eight pound baby, about. You have two liters of amniotic fluid. You have a pound of a placenta and all that is placed directly in the front of the mom. Now, obviously that causes a lot of physiologic changes um, and makes it uncomfortable to be pregnant. But in terms of what you're thinking about here and what's really important to consider, particularly as someone coming to the home of someone who may be experiencing an emergency, is that weight that is placed right on the front of the mom is compressing her vena cava when she's laying flat on her back. And really what we need to think about is, is that with all of that weight, if we position the mom, even just if you say, okay, lay on my stretcher, and we just have her laying completely flat, kind of like she is here, right? We are decreasing the blood flow to the baby. We're also decreasing the blood flow back to the mom because that weight compresses her vena cava. So if you laid her down like this, if this was my patient and I had her laying like this, she'd probably be telling me she doesn't feel good. She probably would start to tell me she feels really lightheaded. She might tell me she's feeling like she has to throw up. Um, and when you go to take her blood pressure, you're going to get a low blood pressure. If I went to take the baby's heart rate, I would get a really low heart rate because I'm compressing all of the, like could be the umbilical cord, but the main vena cava that's going to help to get blood to the placenta. So when we're working with moms, particularly very pregnant moms, we want to make sure that we're putting them in a tilt. So I'm told that you'd probably have bath blankets or an extra pillow or something like that around. So we want to use um, a left lateral position for that. I have my helpers here. You want to put her in there? <laughs> so um, the left is the best way to position her. There's nothing really wrong with the right. It's just that the research shows that perfusion is best when you place um, a mom on the left. Um, so we use the left. Left lateral is just kind of like when I talk, teach my nursing students about this, I'm, real, I'm always like, this is one of the main things that you have to remember. If you remember anything, remember to tilt your pregnant ladies to the left. So that's kind of step number one there. Um, when you reposition her, you're going to really probably see dramatic effects as soon as you reposition her. She will start to feel better pretty much instantaneously. Um, and I know it's kind of daunting because you don't know what's going on with the baby. You don't know what's happening in there. But know that when you do have her positioned that way, the perfusion to the baby is much, much better. So we talked about the cervix, okay? We talked about the cervix having to dilate and efface. So as that's all kind of going on, there really are three stages of labor. The first stage of labor, I usually describe it as thinking about the faces the mom is making, okay? In the first stage of labor, I call that my happy mom. At that point, mom is usually smiling. She's like, oh, I'm having some contractions. They're nice. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to have this baby. She's smiley. She's still talking to you. She might stop when she has one contraction, maybe just to breathe through it, but overall is not completely overwhelmed. And I've taught childbirth classes for years, and I always tell partners in the class that really you can go by mom's face. You know, there really isn't much more to it than this. If she's still chit-chatting with you and seeming happy, then she is not about to deliver that baby, okay? So at this point, the cervix, you know, is starting. So that would be early labor. This is all happening within that first stage. In, this, in active labor, which is happening within that first stage, the contractions are getting much more intense, okay? They're becoming closer, mom's not as happy, she has to focus on her contractions, she's not really wanting to talk with you, so if you're asking her all of those gazillions of questions, 
you know, that we have to ask when we admit people or bring people in about their health history, she's not going to really be chatting with you. So also within the first stage is transition. So this might be where you're coming into the game. Transition is the shortest phase of the first stage of labor, but it's the most intense. So transition is where the cervix is anywhere from 8 to 10 centimeters dilated. So remember, I said it has to be 10 centimeters of the size of that bagel before this baby is about to be delivered. So transition is the part where moms are like, I'm not moving. I'm not getting up from where I'm sitting. If you come into their home and they're you know, sitting in their bathroom, it's really difficult for you to coax them out of there or to coax them to lay down so you can see what's happening. You have to be really specific in your instructions to them. They can't even barely hear you or know that you're there because they're so focused on what's about to um, occur. Because they're, they're, that baby is right there and it's taking them everything that they have to be able to make it through each of these contractions. Um, you know, on TV, when you see people in labor and they always are going, <laughs> they're making that, you know, breathing, panting noise. That's actually what we want them to be doing um, in this stage of labor. They're usually going to say to you a couple things. I feel like I have to have a bowel movement or I feel like I have to poop. Okay, they're going to be telling you that. If they tell you that, do not let them go and sit on the toilet. That will not be a very, that will not end well for anybody involved, okay? Um, if they're telling you, I feel like I have to poop, and they may not be registering this, that the baby is coming, that is just the feeling of the baby coming down the birth canal. When that baby that's eight pounds is coming down the birth canal, it is pushing, the, pushing on the rectum, which is giving them the sensation like they need to have a bowel movement. So they usually tell you, I have, to, I have to poop, please let me go. Don't, okay? Just don't. It doesn't end well. And I've had nursing students and new nurses get in this position where they're like, oh, let me just let them go to the bathroom. Yeah. The other thing they may start to experience at um, this point, they might experience some nausea. They may be shaky. That's all normal and just really common things that they experience. But the really hallmark sign that they're close to delivery is feeling like they have to have a bowel movement. Um, so that's really the first stage. So to recap, the first stage of labor has three phases. Early, mom's chit-chatty. She's pretty happy. She can still chat with you. Her contractions feel to her more like menstrual cramps. The next phase of the first stage is active labor. Active labor, the contractions are much more regular. They're more intense. She has to focus on them, but it's not anywhere near like what she experiences in transition. Transition is the third phase of that first stage, and in that point, they're like totally overwhelmed by what is happening. They're not going to be chit-chatting with you, and the contractions are like back-to-back, -back, like one and a half to two minutes apart. Um, anybody know how to time contractions? Uh huh. You got it. So, if you're trying to figure out about how close together these contractions are, if they had a, a coach or a partner there with them, they probably have been making them time them and write this all down. But if not, it's from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next one. So you would say to the mom, "Okay, tell us when one is starting," or you'll be ob you'll obviously be able to tell when one is starting, and start timing and then time through to the next one starts, and that will tell you about how far apart they are. Remember, as we get closer to delivery, they're going to get closer together, and in transition, typically they're about one and a half to two minutes apart. But we're looking for her to give us signs. You know, um, you know when you arrive there, if she's feeling that rectal pressure, if she's feeling like she has to bear down, um, then we need to, you know, be very focused on that. So the first stage is the labor, okay? The early, the active, the transition. The second stage is the delivery of the baby, okay? So at this point, the contractions, you know, I'm, my guess is if that you're being called there to deliver a baby, either one, this mom has had several babies before, and we know that a mom that has had more and more babies, the labors get quicker and quicker with each one. So she's done this before. She can do it. Um, you know, 
if it was a first baby, um, usually the labors of a first-time mom take up to 24 hours. They take a while. So, you know, that's a little bit of a different uh, scenario there. So my guess is that the ones that you guys get to be called to are going to be women who have done this more than one time. The second stage, the contractions, um, she's going to feel the urge to bear down. You do not have to guide her. You know, she's going to start to bear down on her own when she feels that pressure like she needs to have a bowel movement. Um, so, you know, if, it, if she's feeling that urge, the one thing that I want to tell you not to do is you do not need to place your fingers in there to check, okay? Does anybody know why we say don't just go right in there and check? So you don't rupture any... Uh, Anything important? <laughs> Well, um, so not, not the sack of fluid, but what else might be there that we don't know about when we just, the placenta. Yeah, the placenta. So, you know, one of the things, especially if you're presenting to some place who, you know, who maybe has no prenatal care, maybe there's bleeding, which there usually is bleeding, right? Um, you don't want to place your fingers in the vagina because you could actually put your fingers directly into the placenta. Now, the placenta should not be there. It shouldn't be there, okay? But if you don't know where it's actually inserted, then one of the risks is that you could injure that. Um, when the placenta is covering the cervix, that's called placenta previa. Um, and that's actually, that's dangerous. But you would see bright red, painless bleeding. That's placenta previa's kind of hallmark. It's bright red bleeding but the mom doesn't feel any pain. But unfortunately, when you're coming to the house of somebody in labor, they're probably gonna have some bright red bleeding anyway, okay? At least some as the cervix starts to open. So if the baby's coming, that baby's gonna come on its, come on its own anyway, and you're gonna start to see the head crowning, and that's what you'll wait for, okay? So the baby enters the vagina, navigates the birth canal, and obviously leaves the uterus via the vagina. Um, we're going to go through a birthing simulator, simulation, like practice, you know, once we break. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, after the baby is delivered, you then have two patients, which makes this a little bit more complex because you're going to have, you may have to be dealing with the resuscitation of the baby. Um, as well as managing the mom, if she's have any, having any hemorrhage or anything after the delivery. Um, after the baby is born, within, I would say, five, but no more than 30 minutes, the placenta should be born. What happens is, remember we talked about the uterus that at 36 weeks it's way up here? Well, after delivery, the uterus goes from way up here to the level of the umbilicus. So you had all this surface area that the placenta could hold on to, but when the uterus dropped down to the, to the level of the umbilicus, the placenta didn't have any surface area to hang on anymore. So it starts to come away from the uterine wall and then it's expelled. It really doesn't take much for the placenta to be expelled. You know, the mom just gives a little eh and out comes our placenta. It's not like the push that she had to do to deliver the baby. Um, the, she may notice a little bit of cramping and you may notice a little gush of blood, but it shouldn't be a massive quantity of bleeding. Um, again, that should happen pretty quickly after um, the delivery of the baby and you shouldn't have to be doing any pulling, okay, to pull out, that, to pull the placenta. It should, you know, detach by itself, okay? Any questions on those three? Anything you want to add yet? Okay. <laughs> so, um, I think we went over those things. We talked about the no internal exams. We talked about the primaparis woman. So that's a first, primaparis means this is her first baby. Multiparis women, they come, it comes very quickly. So if you're having a patient that you get to their house and they say, this is my second baby, you can say, how long was your labor? With, tell you that this was a, 
you know, their first one was really fast, then chances are this one is coming down the pike. So you just prepare yourself, get your gloves on and be ready to go. Um, we talked about the amniotic sac and we expected that there could be up to two liters of amniotic fluid in there. So at any point the water can break. There is no set time when the water can break. Now when the water does break during labor, what are we looking for? What do, you, do you care about anything? Does it matter? Blood or meconium. So there's, there's two things that we really, we want it to be clear, okay? It should be clear, sometimes it's like a little yellow tinge, because anybody know what amniotic fluid is? Yeah, it's fetal urine. It's fetal urine, it's sterile, so there you go. But, um, we, so we expect it to be clear. Now, so one thing it could be is meconium. So meconium is the baby's first bowel movement. That can occur, and that means then the amniotic fluid would be green, maybe brown. Sometimes it can just be tinged, and sometimes it can be really like thick brown. That's important for you to take note of, because you will, when you transport this baby to the hospital, you will need to tell um, the receiving facility about that, because that does put the baby at some risk, and you want to make sure that when that baby is being delivered, if you saw that that was meconium stain fluid, that you really vigorously clean out their mouth with that bulb syringe. Um, because think about it, when, they when they're born and they take that first breath, we don't want them to suck that back down into their lungs. Um, so making sure that you really suction out the airway with the bulb syringe um, well. So then blood, that was our, the other thing that we could see. What do you think could cause there to be blood in the amniotic fluid? What could have happened? Trauma, right, so trauma. So what would the bleeding, have, what, what the bleeding come from? Could be a fall, could be a yeah, placental abruption. So the trauma could occur, so maybe you're called to a car accident. Maybe you're, you come to a house and a woman fell. Um, so if there was trauma to the abdomen and then her water broke, the, that could signify that the placenta had started to come away from the uterine wall, okay? Why is that a problem? She could def the mother, yes. The, for the mother, that is a problem because she could, she's hemorrhaging, so she has internal bleeding. Who else is it a problem for? The baby's not, the baby's not getting any blood or oxygen. And so if you see amniotic fluid with blood in it, that can be a problem for both. So we obviously want to go back to our tilt that mom to her side to improve perfusion to the mom and the baby. Obviously, fluid replacement is, is key there, um, as well as oxygenation. And I'll say this now, I know it's going to come up later, but when you're caring for a pregnant woman and you want to give her oxygen, what device should you use? Not, I'm not talking about bagging her. <laughs> a non-rebreather, yes. Always non-rebreather with our pregnant women, not a nasal cannula, because you're not going to give them anywhere near enough. Um, to help perfuse that baby. So just slap it on them, okay? That's the high doses of oxygen for, for these ladies. Um, because again, remember, we have to get their blood nice and oxygenated so they can ox oxygenate their baby as well. Okay, so when the water breaks, it can be clear, which we're like, yay, good, nice and normal. It could be green, brown, which means the baby had a bowel movement. That happens, just make sure we're paying attention to suctioning and letting the providers know about that at receiving facility. And if it's bloody, it means that we could have had what's called an abruption, meaning that the placenta could have come away from the wall and we need to really focus on making sure our mom is well perfused and that she's well oxygenated so we can get as much of that to the baby as possible. Okay? Okay, so our second stage, we, this is recap, the second stage is when she's delivering, right? The contractions are much more frequent. She's feeling that urge to push, like she has to have a bowel movement. And this is my favorite. I, I didn't make the PowerPoint, but this is my favorite bullet. The woman will often make grunting sounds, involuntary during this time. So we're gonna give you an example. Can she do it? <laughs> she was making them. She was. she was making sounds. Well, what I wanted to say about that is that the noises that when a woman is about to give birth, these aren't high-pitched screams, okay? 
that might be somebody who's scared, you know, high pitch and, and screaming might be panic or fear. When someone's giving birth, it's a much deeper grunting sound. And, it, you know, when you're coming in, sometimes people are just panicked or nervous. Fear is up here. Birth is down here, okay? So the, the noises that they're making are very different than fear and panic and just nervousness. So you'll definitely be able to tell a distinct um, difference about that. So my understanding is that with EMT is that when you get to the scene, that you, this is the decision point. The decision point is should you stay here and deliver this baby or do I have time to pack her up and quickly get her somewhere? And I think there's probably a lot of variables to that. The weather, um, how far, you know, oh, there she is. Can we get it again? <laughs> I don't know. Let me see if I. Yeah. Let's see. Can I can I give her the? <laughs> oh she, oh now she's feeling nauseous because she's gonna have the baby. <laughs> and don't stand in front of her when she when she does that. Um, because I have, and it's not good. Um, so you need to decide about transport. So obviously there's a variety of factors. So the weather, obviously, but is this her first baby versus is this her second or her third? How long was her previous labor? These are all things that could help to guide you. Obviously, if she's making that grunty type of noise, if she's saying she feels like she has to bear down, if you can see the baby's head, you know, you look, then it's, you're going to have to glove up and, and be ready. So a uh, difficult point to decide, okay, do we go or do we have to stay here and, and deliver this baby? Um, and that will be a judgment call based on what's going on um, at that time. Nice picture of a placenta. Um, but like I said, your, your key there is that once that baby delivers, that placenta really should come fairly quickly, uh, five to 15 minutes. If you're getting to 30 minutes and you haven't seen a placenta, we would be getting concerned at the hospital that it's retained. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting her transported um, to the hospital. Would you say, so if you were doing like a home birth, to wait for the placenta or is it safe to transport you after the baby? You could transport. I would, I would say you could transport her, yes. Yeah, um, because now you have the baby and the placenta, you, you know, it's just basically just comes out into your little bucket or bedpan or whatever you're using to collect it in. Um, but I would say start transporting her. Because that's usually where at the hospital, you know, we're getting worried and where you're going to start to see issues like hemorrhage after that placenta comes. So you, that's why you want them someplace else at that point. Any other questions? So um, roles and responsibilities, gathering data. Um, so if you were coming to the house, okay, you got a phone, you got a call that said, you know, there's a woman who thinks she's delivering the baby, and you get there. What are some questions that you would want to ask her? Ha have you had a baby before? Oh, have you had prenatal care? That's, that's a great question. Um, and she said no. No. Oh, she said no. No prenatal care. Is this her first child? Is this her first child? What is her answer? Yes, it's her first child. How far along? Oh, but she's had no prenatal care. But she might be able to guess. How might? How? How is she? There you go. When's your last menstrual period? Now. That does involve a little bit of math, unless you have a obstetric wheel on your <laughs> ambulance. But we know that a pregnancy lasts about 40 weeks, right? So if she says that she's had no prenatal care, you could ask her when her last menstrual period was. That would be like the next question that you might want to ask her and try to figure out about how far along you think, um, you think she is. What other questions? Have you been pregnant? Have you been pregnant before? And that's a great way to say it because sometimes if we just say, 
you know, um, is this the first baby you've delivered or when's the last time you delivered? We do want to know about if she's had miscarriages and that this kind of gives us more information when we phrase it that way. Any other questions? Medical history, yeah. You know, a lot of times when we come to see pregnant women, we get focused on just the complications of pregnancy, but we forget that we need to ask them about their medical history. Pretty much the information and data, data gathering should seem very similar to any other patient that you go to, except for you're going to insert a few of these really specific questions like, you know, what number of pregnancy is this for you? Have you had prenatal care? Because she could tell us that she has methadone for drug use, that she um, has severe asthma. She could tell us any number of um, kind of medical information that would really guide our care one way or another. Any other questions that you'd want to ask? Oh, that's a great question. So I don't know if you guys heard, but she said at the last prenatal care appointment, what position was the baby in? Because what if she tells us that when she went to our doctor's last, the baby was in the breech position, so meaning that the butt or feet are coming first. That might be concerning for us, right? We know we might have to prepare for something else if this baby is coming. Have you done any illicit drugs? Great question. Have you done any illicit drugs? So even if she doesn't offer that up, that is a question that we want to ask. Why does that question matter to us? Okay, so he, he brought forward that the baby might come out dependent on drugs, which is definitely something that at the hospital we need to focus on. But what might you all be especially concerned about if she was like, oh, I was just out and I... Um, I'd more suspect an FGAR of zero for a longer period of time. So we need a, might need to intubate or at least ventilate. Right, so a resuscitation. Um, and we're going to get into AFGARs a little bit, but the data gathering is almost the most important part. Um, and, you know, in my nursing class, we do actually a simulation specifically on data gathering, and that's all they do is data gather because what the data you find is, gonna, is giving you the clues about what you're about to encounter, what's going to happen to you in the next couple of minutes so you can prepare. So if she did say, you know, yes, I just used X, Y, or Z, you have to be prepared and you know then that you're going to have to call for ALS. <laughs> I want to make sure I said the right thing. <laughs> um, if she's having potentially twins or oh. mm -hmm. That's a, that would be a good question to ask. How many are in there? Is this one baby? Um, you know, is this a singleton or is this two? And that definitely um, is something that you want to know because one's coming, another one should be coming in pretty... I can't remember. Is multiple births, is this one single presented at branch or they have multiple... Depends. Could be, could be any number of things. There's actually several different uh, ways. You could have two placentas, one placenta, two sacs, one sac. So you don't need to know about any of that. Just say, are there two? And then you know whether to prepare yourself for a second one and then just get yourself to the hospital ASAP. Would a history of alcohol use be a valid question? Yes, definitely. So I would even, I kind of, when I'm asking questions, I lump my drug and alcohol use into kind of one question and just say, you know, have you used, um, you know, any drugs or alcohol? Yeah. Blood type, yeah, that's a great question. Um, however, I, one thing I will say, we do want to know the blood type, um, but at, yeah, but the one thing is that at the hospital, we will never take a patient's um, word on their blood type. Uh, <laughs> that's one of those things where we can't just take your word on that. We have to have it confirmed. So when she gets to the hospital, even if she's postpartum, even if she's already delivered, we would draw labs on her to confirm her, her blood type. Even if it's already been documented in her prenatal care, we redocument it upon her admission. I think definitely we want data on, but we would confirm it. Oh. Uh, from, a, from a toxicity issue with, uh, with uh, the wrong blood type, mm -hmm. that would take longer than it would take the time to transport her right. to show. So it's not really for us to be concerned. Right, you got it. You got it. But that's something that we that at the hospital we would be thinking about. Yeah? Uh, previous complications of previous pregnancy. You, that's a great one. And that's actually going to tie into something we're going to try in a practical standpoint. But generally, how her previous birth went is going to really show how this birth is going to go for, for us. So, um, you know, we're going to talk something about uh, with delivery if the shoulder gets stuck. We, if she had a baby before and it's smooth sailing right on out, that baby just 
Okay, and we're like, yeah, good. This is good. <laughs> pretty much going to probably have the same thing happen again. If she told us about some complications that occurred, or what about if she delivered by a C-section before? That, that throws a little bit of a monkey wrench, but if the baby's head is crowning, we, there's nothing we can do about it. We have to go with it. But it is important for us to be aware of what went on in that previous delivery um, so that we can kind of assess the situation. So that's a great one. You guys are doing really good. Any other ones? Yeah, so along with blood type, Rh positive, Rh negative. But I think you got, you got the main ones, um, and I think that the data gathering is so important. And then the next thing, staying calm. Um, you know, <laughs> coming in there and being like, ah, I've never had to do this before is not going to be. Because <laughs> that's, that's what she's doing. That shouldn't be what we're doing, right? <laughs> Even if we feel that. And I, I always tell my students that when... I worked uh, as a med surge nurse first and then decided, oh, uh, I'll try this labor and delivery thing. And I don't really know why. I was thinking I wanted to work in shock trauma and somehow wound up in labor and delivery. And um, for probably a good, the good first year or two years, every single time the baby's heart rate would go down, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I would really stand there like, oh my gosh, I think I'm not breathing. And then after you do it for a while, you're like, turn to your left, turn to your right, here's some fluid, here's some oxygen, and it comes back up. So you really can do all of this. It's just, it seems really like overwhelming at the time. And it is, it's, it's exciting for everybody and nerve wracking. But babies have been delivering themselves for gazillions of years and it will happen again. Obviously there are emergencies, um, but you're prepared for it. So staying calm super key. Timing the contractions, the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction, that's giving you an idea of about where you are, remember, in those uh, phases of labor, whether you're in the early active or transition. But most likely, if she's calling you there, you're probably close to delivery. She's going to be saying, I feel a lot of pressure in my bottom. Don't let her go to the bathroom because then your baby will be in the toilet and that's never good. Um, Examining for crowning, so in your data gathering um, with the questions, always placing a little eye on the prize to see if there is a head actually there will be very helpful to determine if you need to get your gloves on quickly or not. Um, you can palpate for contractions, and that's actually the best way to do this. I know everyone thinks, oh my gosh, I have to have all those special monitors that they use at the hospital. No. I, I tell my students all the time, you know, you have to place your hands on the patient. A lot of times we get so uh, tied up in wanting to use all of this special equipment that we forget to actually touch the patient. And contract the best way to determine if someone's having contractions is to actually palpate for them. And that just means take your hands, lay them on the mom's stomach, and when the stomach gets really hard, so kind of feeling like your forehead, okay, if it feels like your forehead, that's a strong contraction. So you feel it, you can look at your watch. You feel it again, you know, feel it get soft, keep timing. And when you feel it get hard again, like your forehead, that's the next contraction. So it's just a muscle. That's all it is, is the uterus just getting super tight and contracting. That's your contraction. Um, talking about vital signs, um, vital signs are, you know, key during pregnancy. We re Oh, question. Sorry. Are there conditions where a woman could be having a lot of contractions but not actually be... In labor? Yeah. So, um, some women have prodromal labor, which is kind of like annoying contractions that occur. Essentially, think of someone sitting next to you, maybe your partner sitting next to you here, punching you just in your arm every couple minutes for a couple days. So that's prodromal. <laughs> it's annoying, not super painful, but annoying. Um, those type of contractions uh, don't usually result in cervical change, but they're annoying and uncomfortable contractions. Um, but she would not be saying, I feel like I need to bear down. She would not be making that like grunting kind of guttural noise. Um, she just might be more complaining of having all this uh, kind of pain. Um, the other time when you could be having some, you know, you will have pain in the abdomen, 
but it not necessarily be delivery? Does anybody know? Braxton. Okay, Braxton Hicks, so let me say what Braxton Hicks are. Braxton Hicks are warm-up contractions or workout contractions. Um, they're kind of similar like where they're just like these little kind of uncomfortable things. Um, true labor versus false labor, that's kind of what that is. People will say Braxton Hicks are false labor. Generally in false labor, moms just feel the pain or the contractions right here on the front of their belly. Um, they don't feel it in their back. When actual labor contractions are going on, it wraps from the back around to the front. Now, anybody know another time when you might have severe pain? This would be a trauma one. Severe pain in the abdomen, but it's not really um, related to the, the delivery. Placental abruption, right. So there's two uh, placental issues that we talked about. One was previa, placenta previa. So placenta previa, I call that one sudden and sneaky, okay? Placenta previa is sudden and sneaky because there's no pain associated with it, and it's when the placenta is covering the cervical os. And so women will just like wake up in the middle of the night, and they might just have blood all in their bed, okay? And there's just all this blood, but they have no pain, and it's just horrifying, right? So that's placenta previa. Placental abruption is when typically related to a trauma or it can be related to like very high blood pressure, but whatever, ha whatever it is, the placenta is ripped off the wall of the uterus. So this bleeding from this can, you, you might see all the bleeding, you may not, sometimes it's concealed, but what you will notice is they'll be saying they have horrible pain in their belly. And if you feel their belly, you palpate, because you know we said, oh, we're supposed to palpate contractions, it feels hard, like rigid and board-like is the term that I always tell my students. It should rigid and board-like. Um, that one, if you take vital signs, you're probably going to get some hypotension because they're bleeding internally. So this is get you to the hospital, both of them, just get you there quick. Pack you up and start driving. Okay? So that would be when you might have the pain, but not necessarily be... But both of those, would you have to, again, it's the context. So you're gathering data, right? I came to a, if I come to a car accident, trauma to your belly, it shouldn't just be I come to a car accident and a woman just happens to be in labor. It might happen, but maybe not. Yeah? The abruption? So abruption can be from various, can, can be from different things, but usually it's something that has resulted in the placenta being like kind of torn off the wall of the uterus. Most often I would say trauma, but high blood pressure. So if you came and let's say, um, you know, you took a patient's blood pressure and it was very, very high, that can result in that. And if she was saying, oh my gosh, I'm having all this belly pain, those things. <coughs> Oxygen left side and in most cases fluids. Now what, how about fluids? Let's talk about fluids for a second. In the pregnant patient, what type of fluids do you just, it's pretty much the fluids that you all give. <laughs> yes, yes, that's it, yes, lactated ringers. And um, in most of the cases, you know, we're pretty free with our fluids in labor and delivery, much more free with our fluids than most other places. I would say the only time we're not as free with those fluids is our preeclamptic patients um, who have very high uh, blood pressures. But otherwise, you know, because we are resuscitating babies with those fluids. It's not just always, we think of volume replacement not just for the mom, but when we increase circulating blood volume, we're increasing the blood flow and the oxygenation to the baby as well. So um, I know we're much more free with that than other, you know, specialties. They usually look at us like, you're just throwing all those fluids in. Um, and we usually use ringers. Are you being affected by the uh, IV bag uh, shortage caused by Puerto Rico? I have not heard that. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. How would it be, like, I know, like, you would decrease the blood volume, blood volume, you know, like, it would, uh, you 
Right. How would that actually increase the oxygenation? Would it just increase the flow? It, it increases the blood flow, and yeah, so it's increasing the circulating volume, which then um, improves the perfusion to the, to the baby. So I know that we're getting close to time, so I'm supposed to keep... So, um, you know, just remember that this is an emotional time. So in addition, in addition to focusing on the fact that this baby is coming out, to pro be providing emotional support to the mother, um, you know, somebody on the team maybe holding her hand, helping her focus through this, because this is, this is traumatic for her too. She didn't, most likely she didn't plan for this to happen on her bathroom floor or, you know, laying somewhere in her house. So um, emotional support is key. We already talked about this, so I can move past that. Um, and so now once we have the mother, uh, you know, the mother all kind of tied up here and she's delivered, we have a baby now. So you've gone from having one patient to two patients. Um, and you know, when working in labor and delivery, it really tricks people because when there's a baby in there, you do have two patients and we're trying to manage both of those. And sometimes people forget about that other patient when they're not out there actually making noise or kind of in your face. So when you have a newborn, okay, or a newly born, um, and the definition of newly born is a baby within one hour of birth. After one hour of birth, it's defined as a new just because your protocols define it that way. Um, so just to kind of loop that back to what your protocols say. So babies that you're going to have to be concerned about are babies with no prenatal care. So if uh, a woman tells you she has had no prenatal care, that is actually, you know, it, it's going to put my spidey senses up because I'm going to be like a little nervous about what, what this baby is going to be like. Um, premature delivery. So if the baby is less than 37 weeks, um, I'm going to be concerned there because we know that babies that are younger or premature um, may not have well-developed lungs, so that's going to be concerning. Um, labor brought on by trauma, obviously because the placenta, you know, the baby may not have been as well perfused as it needed to be. Um, any other medical conditions? So we talked about preeclampsia again. Any other medical condition may result in alterations to the perfusion of the baby, and we may not get a baby that's vigorous um, upon delivery. Multiple births, um, prenatal history of placenta previa or breach, we talked about those. And any uh, drug, drug history or meconium staining. Okay, so what are you doing? Clearing the area. Providing privacy. Obviously, if this is like a whole family gathering and like everybody's staring around, we want to keep the area as private as possible for the mother um, and or if it was someplace in public to provide privacy because, again, she does not want everyone staring at her. Staying as calm as possible. Making sure that you have on your protective equipment. Um, remember splashes, okay? When you least expect it, splashes can come your way with this. Even right after the delivery, sometimes a big splash can come at you, urine can come at you, so making sure that you have on all your protective equipment. Um, you can elevate her buttock, so whether it's with a rolled up bath blanket or with an inverted um, bedpan. I prefer the bath blanket just because the inverted bedpan is not very comfortable. If you've ever had to lay on an inverted bedpan, try it once and then you probably won't use it anymore. It's not very comfortable. Um, remove clothing that impedes your view or access to the area, obviously. Sometimes women forget this. They're like trying to keep all their clothes on. You need to, like to have a baby, that needs to be off. Um, you can use the family, use their partners. Their partners want to help you, but the key is you have to instruct them specifically on what you want them to do. Otherwise, they're just kind of, they could be um, not so helpful to you and be more impeding. But if you tell them, stand by her, stand by her head, hold her hand, you know, help her as she's pushing down, they'll do anything. And we sometimes don't mobilize our resources the best as we can. Um, have your kit. So my understanding is this is what your little kits look like. Um, hopefully you've looked at those before. Um, and have them prepared. You should have this open and ready to go. <laughs> Exciting, like I feel like I should run out. <laughs>
Maybe they're going to deliver a baby. That would be super exciting. <laughs> I feel excited. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'll just. Okay. Well, we'll just keep going here. We're getting there. <laughs> okay. So, um, one of the key points here, in addition to having all your supplies or trying, you know, getting your kit out, is to making sure that you're keeping the area as warm as possible, particularly when it's like this out here. Um, you know, sometimes women, pregnant women, like it very cool because they're sweating. You know, the old term, they have a bun in the oven. But as soon as that baby is out, thermal regulation is like your, your top priority. Um, so preparing for that, I know in the hospital, right before birth, if the mom had it super cool in the room, we turn the heat, we crank the heat in the room because we know that that baby is so sensitive to cold stress um, that we're heating up that room. So if you can heat up the area in any way and prepare that way, that's, that's really important. And your best warmer is your mother. Okay, not your mother, the baby's mother. <laughs> so you want to take that baby and get it right on mom's chest after you've dried and stimulated it. That's, that's really the key there. Um, this just outlines all of the things that are in your OB kit that you should have um, access to. Okay, so, um, so I'm just going to assume that you have a sneak in here. Oh, that. We're just going to talk about protocols for a minute. When was the last time anybody looked at the OB protocol? Today? Two weeks ago? ago? Yep. So we're just going to uh, follow this um, along a little bit to just um, uh, just refresh kind of what we're supposed to do. Sorry. I always do that. So this is our, our obstetric and GYN uh, emergency childbirth algorithm. Um, Pre-transport, I just want to throw something in there about pre-transport. So if you get pre-transported and they tell you the baby's already delivered, what might you think about doing? How many patients do you have? Two. two? How many ambulances would you like? You would like two, right? So call for help. Um, if you get any other information, like maybe the baby is a preemie, what kind of other, what kind of ambulance do you want to make sure you have at least on the row? You want ALS, right? You don't want to be doing this by yourself, right? I'm not an ALS provider here, so I want to call my friends. All right, so then uh, we're just going to go right down the list here. Um, excessive bleeding, all of these things where it points over here, remember, go to the high priority patient where you need ALS and it's a high priority patient. So if everything's good here, there's no excessive bleeding, there's no seizure, you see the baby's head as opposed to what else? Foot, an arm, a leg, or something else. All those things are good. If the amniotic sac hasn't broken, you can puncture that amniotic sac and keep on going. Suction and support the head, right? All these other things are here are things that we don't really want to see. Um, absorbed bleeding, um, all the OB people that I've talked with say if you're absorbing bleeding, it's really hard to count how much bleeding that is, so you want to save all those things that you've been using to absorb the bleeding. If you have pads or blankets, whatever you're using, take it all with you. Get a bag, put it in a bag. If you have a red bag in your ambulance, which you should, use that to keep all this stuff for all the people in the OB unit who want to count and weigh and measure all that stuff. So let's see, patient who's having seizures, transporting that left lateral position, maintain body temperature and always have the suction ready. How many suction units do you have on your vehicle? You should have like two, right? One attached to the wall and one a portable one. They don't do any good. If they're stuck in a cabinet, get them out so you can use them. How about if you have, let's see, what is next over here? You have a hand or foot presents. Are you going to be able to deliver if there's only one foot or a hand hanging out? No, we need to move that one along, right? Uh, left lateral position, ALS, and transport. Uh, how about a foot or butt presents? Well, you might be able to deliver that one. Deliver the baby, um, support the baby. Um, we want to be able to use a V to open that airway. You're just using a V, putting it inside the vagina, right? 
to, to make sure you make a V over that mouth so that we protect that airway. And guess what? ALS and transport. How about if, oh, I'm sorry, I was, I'm not left-handed. Uh, how about if your cord presents? This is a little bit different. If your cord presents, what's the problem with that? Yeah, it, it, it pinches off the blood of the baby, so we want that cord to be free. It's the only other time that we're, we really need to do something about that. So our protocol tells us to position the mother face down, butt up, wrap the cord, keep it moist. Uh, and <coughs> So face down, butt up. Keep that umbilical cord. So back to the umbilical cord because it's still hanging out, right? <laughs> Your umbilical cord is still hanging out. We want to keep it moist. And we want the mother face down, butt up. We're going to insert that gloved hand to lift the baby's um, lift the baby, like maybe the head or the face or whatever that part is, lift it off the cord so we're not pinching that cord. Everybody good with that? And you're going to keep your hand there with the pressure off the cord until when? Until you have a physician or, or wherever you are who's ready to take over that. Um, so what would that look like in the back of your ambulance, face down, butt up? None of our restraints are really geared for that, so uh, whoever's driving needs to be really careful that we don't topple mom over on the floor. Restrain as best you can. Like saline, saline uh, right, right, sterile saline. So you can just get, some, get a trauma pad, get some saline, and, um, and keep that moist. And guess what? If you're BLS, do you want help? You betcha. You want help with that? You want ALS, high-priority transport. Uh, so let's see, we're going to go on to the next one. So then we can one, uh, if we deliver shoulders, this is a good, this is a good one over here. Deliver the remainder of the baby, breathing, yes, good. Cut, clamp and cut the cord. Deliver the placenta, we already talked about that. Um, and, uh, and Brian and I were on one a few months ago, and I found the best thing to do with that placenta was to put it in an emesis bag. You know those little round bags for pee and poop and body fluids? It works really well for that placenta. Toss it in that bag, everything is contained, and take it to, with the mom. You have a question? Yes. Um, so, in a situation where the cord is present and they have to be in that position for transport, once you get to the hospital, how are you supposed to? That's a really good question. I'm hoping that you have called ahead, right? You're calling that hospital head, you're telling that situation. I would want help when I'm getting out of that ambulance. So hopefully they know that you're coming. They might direct you to a very special place to go instead of the usual ER. I don't know. It depends on where you're going. If uh, the if we have a patient that's like in a labor room and this happens, I would, you know, place my hand to relieve pressure, she would flip to hands and knees, so there's a little picture of that, hands and knees, okay? Um, and, you know, we would transport her on the bed, like that, with me sitting on the bed, like this, to the operating room. When we get to the operating room, obviously I need to flip her back around, so then I have to remove my hand, flip her onto the operating room. So there, there may be a time, like, for you to get her in there, like out of the back of the ambulance to another stretcher, she may have to turn around. That's just, just part of it. There's really no other way. Because you don't want her to f fall off. That would, that's much worse. Um, so uh, there may be, that just has to happen. Okay, good. So, um, so call ahead. Tell them what's coming so they can get resources that hopefully meet you. Um, okay, so what's next? Uh, clamp and cut the cord. Uh, you want to clamp the cord about 10 inches away from the baby and then cut it. Anybody know? Three to four inches closer to the baby. Um, excessive bleeding, treat that. Uh, you want to consider uterine massage. And remember, we want to call our ALS friends and transport to a medical facility. Uh, okay, so uh, do you want me to just keep on going, Adrian? Okay, so uh, remember, we don't deliver babies. The moms do. Uh, you want to position yourself so that you can keep that vaginal opening uh, in view. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of that. We've talked about the grunting. Allow her to push when she feels like she needs to push. Uh, birthing the head uh, when the head is coming out. 
you want to provide gentle support around the perineum and the head, you're not pushing the head back in and you're not pulling it out. Don't do those things. Uh, as the head emerges, you want to um, be able to support it with one hand and a towel maybe. Have something, um, have something that, you know, the baby's going to go in that is not going to be slippery. That is, um, babies are really slippery. If the amniotic sac hasn't broken, you're going to go ahead and rupture it. And I think we've talked about all those. There's just some nice pictures about here about how you're going to be able to support that head and then support the rest of the body. See how those fingers are looped around that baby? When, if somebody's coming and that baby's coming out, I'm not going to, I'm going to keep the baby right there um, low in that position. I want that umbilical cord to be able to continue to pump blood to the baby. I don't want to lift the baby up so the blood doesn't have to go uphill. Keep the baby down right there so it's nice and safe. Have a nice dry towel, dry the baby off. Um, this is where it's nice to have somebody else here working with you so that you can do that. Uh, what are you having somebody get ready to do? Wipe the face, uh, dry away, or wipe away those secretions and suction airway if you have to. Clamping the cord is not, um, not urgent. I will tell you on, uh, that Baltimore County will probably tell whoever's there if the baby's out to go ahead and clamp the cord. They're going to get some instructions to do that. However, you know, they might tie it or cut it off with something perhaps less precise than what you have in your kit. Um, but it's not a real priority. It's not urgent unless the cord is wrapped tightly around the neck and is interfering with your delivery around the neck. You want to stick some fingers in here and keep it off the neck so we don't strangle that baby. And if you're neonate, it, it's hard to do that when the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck, so don't do that. So the World Health Organization recommends waiting at least a minute. We want all the blood the baby can have from the mother uh, to the baby. Um, okay, there's a nice, happy, healthy baby. Yay for that. Okay, so another protocol is, uh, is what to do with this newly born uh, child. Um, <clears throat> warm, dry suction and position and stimulate that baby so that it's safe. Hopefully we've called somebody else. I'm only too happy to give away a baby if I have an opportunity to do that. Um, suction, if, if you need to do that, um, look at that breathing rate. You want to look if a patient has agonal or gasping breaths, and you really want to look at that heart rate. So how would you look at that heart rate in that baby? What are you going to do? Probably take your pulse ox. Remember, to your pulse ox, and you can put, a, um, put the finger or the foot probe on it and attach it to a toe. So look for the heart rate and you're looking for cyanosis. If you have to ventilate that baby, it's 40 to 60 breaths a minute. So it's breath 1,000, breath 1,000, that's all it is. That would be 60 breaths a minute. Don't ever do. And we want to give the baby one full minute before we connect to that 100% oxygen. Uh, excuse me. For a heart rate less than 60 after 30 seconds of vague valve mass ventilation, we're going to do compressions, 120 compressions a minute, and we're going to we're going to sneak those uh, ventilations in there at a ratio of three to one. We don't want to use AEDs on newly born patients, and we want our ALS friends there to be able to care for rhythm and uh, other treatment that we might need. So uh, I'm not sure this is a time to go over all of the ALS stuff that the folks need. If you're an ALS provider looking at breathing and looking and evaluating that heart rate is really going to guide all of the things that you're going to need to do as an ALS provider. I think that's a little bit beyond us for our time here this evening. So the other thing you want to think about um, is this APGAR chart. When patients are, are babies are born at hospitals, we want to do an APGAR at one and five minutes. Uh, so we're really looking for a few things. One, muscle tone, pulse rate, um, how irritable is that baby color and we're looking at respiratory rate and patients will either get a zero a one or a two based upon whatever we find of course if we get there 10 minutes after the baby is born they're not going to get a one in five minute APGAR but I just wanted to add one thing um, yeah. A lot of pl one place where I think that uh, people get really stuck is the respirations it, it's not the respiratory rate it's the respiratory effort so you do, people waste time and they're like trying to count the rate. If this baby is screaming, crying, you got a good baby, okay? Because once we see screaming and crying, the pinkness is coming, the heart rate is, if they're screaming and crying, the heart rate's good. You know, if you were screaming and crying, your heart rate wouldn't be five. You know, it, it would be good. 
So if you have this baby that's in front of you that's screaming and crying, you're in good shape. Remember, with babies, their issues are mostly respiratory. Their hearts are great. They're, they're new. So they don't really have those issues like older people have with their hearts most of the time. If a baby that's screaming and crying, then just stick to the dry, stimulate, and keep it warm, and you're, you're doing good. So we don't want you to forget it's about the mom either. Don't wait for a long time to be delivering that placenta. If it doesn't, if it doesn't come out, you're going to go ahead and, um, and transport that patient. Watch for bleeding. Take, the, um, take your pads and your blankets with you. You can stimulate that uterus to contract when the uterus um, um, uh, almost feels like a grapefruit, so you can massage that. That helps to um, that helps to control bleeding in the mom. You can put the baby to breast, um, so uh, breastfeeding can help to um, to uh, slow bleeding and uh, in the mom. So that's good, and it's also good for the baby. Very good for the baby, and it helps to keep the baby next to the mom and keep the baby warm. So that's a good thing. Reevaluate your, ble re your bleeding, apply a pad if you need to, um, watch your vital signs, and uh, of course, clean, sheet, clean and dry sheets. We always have lots of those, right? Um, so what are some complications? Well, I should probably turn this one over. But breach is anything other than a head-first delivery uh, for the baby, uh, increased risk of cord prolapse and uh, fetal and maternal injury. You want uh, to initiate rapid transport to the hospital. There's really not much that we can do about that. If the baby does deliver, um, you may need to um, protect that airway with your glove finger um, in that V-shape in, inside the vag vagina. Prolapse umbilical cord, we just talked about that a little bit. You're going to insert your two fingers, and you want to release the pressure of the cord on the cord there. Uh, you want to keep it in sterile saline soaked towels. Don't pull on the cord and don't push it back inside. Multiple births, we talked about that a little bit. Um, so if a patient's having twins, how many other ambulances do you want? I don't know about you. I want one for each patient, right? If you have to do resuscitation on multiple patients, you need multiple vehicles here. So keep your dispatchers aware. Um, it may be a high risk of... Uh, a breach for a second and they may be small they may be very tiny you need to really really keep them warm what else can you use to keep them warm other than blankets mom. no way mom. mom and what else no I wouldn't use a hot bag no nope. what else what's in your ambulance and in your kit do you remember those emergency blankets you have lots of emergency blankets um, I would you can put a baby maybe inside a towel or a bath blanket and wrap it in with, uh, with those emergency blankets. Those are uh, real good. They're huge, though, so you might maybe want to cut it in half or something. So other OB emergencies, uh, if a patient has seizures, a patient has um, uh, needs some medication for that, large bore IV, watch the airway, uh, airway oxygen suctioning uh, for sure. Uh, if about that placental abruption is we're looking for a history of placenta previa, all these other things, IV, left uterine displacement, transport, and what kind of oxygen? Yeah, non-rebreather, exactly right. Other OB emergencies, I think we've talked about all of these. Um, and these are the rapid or the relevant protocols for EMS. We talked about uh, most of these, vaginal bleeding, uh, we need to notify and we need to um, save whatever that is. So if uh, we put hypothermia in here. Keep those babies and those moms warm. Don't let them get cold. If you have a trauma patient who's pregnant, in case you don't remember the really, really fine print, I need a magnifying glass. Patients who are pregnant who are greater than 20 weeks who are trauma patients are category delta. You almost don't need to think about anything else unless you've got something that superimposes that. What are our specialty care centers? Where are you going to take that patient? want to take care of the mom. Uh, so perinatal centers around here, Johns Hopkins and Bayview, uh, Frederick Memorial, if you're out that way, Sinai, St. Agnes, and University of Maryland Medical Center. Neonatal Center, Bayview, GBMC, Sinai, St. Agnes. So around here, the ones that do both, if you have a mom and you have a baby, Sinai and University of Maryland Medical Center would be, would be those. Um, uh, Adrian, do you have any words of wisdom of uh, if you have a choice of what do you have to do? Obviously, if you have a sick mom, you're going to a perinatal center. Whoever's closest, right? Uh, 
And so, so they're, um, there you go. And they can transport, right? Um, okay, does anybody have any other questions? Because that is the end of that. The next is, the, we just had some reference slides here. So what we want to do next is take a break. You all have been very patient. Why don't we take about 10 minutes? Uh, we are short one OB instructor today. So what we want to do is, is reconvene here with our mannequin, and she's going to actually deliver. We can walk through a real delivery. Then we're going to head over into our ambulance red floor, and we're going to deal with a complication um, for that. So why don't you take about 10 minutes, and then come on back. You want to get a vital sign, okay? Attempt to get the vital sign, your baseline vital sign, when she's not pushing, if you can. Um, however, just kind of to keep in mind, even if you do have to get it while she's pushing, because sometimes they're just always pushing or, you know, something's always happening, especially in transition when the contractions are really close, the vi her blood pressure should not be sky high, okay? In pregnancy, generally your blood pressure shouldn't go too much outside of what your normal is. So unless she has a history of chronic hypertension, you would not expect to see crazy high blood pressures. If it's a crazy high blood pressure, then you're worried about preeclampsia, okay? So if she has preeclampsia and you take her blood pressure, you come in, you're like, okay, I'm gonna take your vital signs. You get the vital sign and let's say it's really high, like you get 200 over 110, okay? What's the next question? Okay. Okay, hang in there, hang in there, we're coming. What's the next questions you might want to ask her? Okay. What, what are the, so you might want to ask if she's had it before, what are the other signs and symptoms of preeclampsia? You guys know? Ha had any seizures? Swelling? Swelling? Um, blurry vision, spots before your eyes, or pain in her epigastric area, okay? So blurry vision, spots before her eyes, pain in the epigastric area. If she starts telling you that kind of stuff and her blood pressure is really high, you could be worried about her becoming eclamptic or seizing, okay? So we get there, our patient has wonderful vital signs. This is actually her fifth baby and she has had multiple babies at home before. So we say, okay, hang with us and we're talking to her kindly and trying to support her. We're all staying calm, but we know that the next thing we should probably do is put our gloves on. I don't have any gloves, but I'm going to put my gloves on and we're going to look, right? Because we want to assess for, what am I looking for? Crowning, Crowning right? Because we don't need to be experts and check cervical dilatation, but we're going to assess for crowning. So what I usually tell my patients is um, you can, like we said, you can use the bedpan. Not the most comfortable option, but you can use it if you can't visualize. It'll give you a little bit of um, the ability to be able to see her perineum. That's why we want to use that bedpan. So the perineum is the space between the vagina and the rectum. And the reason that we're concerned about this is that if this baby is delivered precipitously or as the baby is being delivered, you want to be able to support that area because we don't want this to tear, okay? Um, so we look and this baby is crowning. We can see the top of the head there um, with our friend. So we know that this delivery is imminent. So our decision then is we're gonna stay here and deliver the baby rather than place her uh, back in the ambulance and try to get her to the hospital. So we have to prepare for delivery. So remember we said that we want to make sure that we're prepared in terms of wearing our PPE, and making sure we have goggles or something on because this could be splashy. We want to see if her amniotic fluid has broken, so we might want to ask her about that. If, the, um, if it has, we want to know if it's clear or some other color, okay? But if we see the head there, we're just going to prepare for delivery. So let me get my stuff here for us. Okay, so we have our delivery kit with all of our supplies in there. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure we have ready is our bulb syringe because as soon as this baby comes out, it's getting ready to take its first breath, right? So we need to make sure that we suction its airway. Um, the other thing that we really want to focus on is drying and warming the baby because we're getting ready to have two patients. And remember, we might have dads running around. So dad, will you go and sit, stand by her head? Okay, so, <laughs> so she's yelling out so we can tell him, okay, support her, hold her hand, take care of her as, 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 she's, 
as she's getting ready. Um, you can have her, depending on the situation, she can grab a hold of her legs, okay, to kind of give you space. You can ask her to grab a hold of her knees. Um, you can ask the partner uh, or somebody in your room, your partner or a dad can, can hold here. So can you come in and hold her leg? Sure. Okay. And then can you come and hold her leg here? So we have her holding her leg, okay. And so we're getting prepared. We have our sterile drapes down because the baby's getting ready to come. Okay, the baby can begin to come. Now our baby is going to come out, at least it should. <laughs> oh, it's coming. So I'm gonna support her bottom, okay? I'm supporting the perineum. So the baby's head is coming, so I'm gonna suction out the baby's mouth and nose and the shoulders are getting ready to come she should release <laughs> you wouldn't have to pull like this okay this is this is my so, so down and then bring her up that should be hooked <laughs> okay so as soon as the baby comes out I want to dry this baby vigorously, okay? That is your first thing that you really need to be doing. My umbilical cord keeps coming off. So you're drying this baby, you wanna get them warm. So we're looking at this point, we're really assessing this baby for how well it's doing right at this point. So you can relax her legs down at, the, at that point. So we're looking at the APGAR score, right? So our APGAR score has five components, but our biggest thing is respiration or respiratory effort. So is this baby crying? What's the color of this baby? Is it pink? Is it blue? Most babies, how many have seen a baby just born? Okay, are they super pink? No. Nah. They look kind of like baby aliens is what I have to say, okay? <laughs> They're not, when most people though, when they think about babies, they think like really like a six month old, like some pink chubby little baby, but newborns don't look like that. So we want them to be pink centrally, okay? So face and chest. We want them to have a good respiratory effort. They may be blue in their hands and feet, but that's okay. That's normal kind of transition stuff. So get a warm, get this baby crying, and get the, make sure the baby's pink. But drying and warming the baby will help with their, um, their pink. So then in your kit, you're gonna have clamps and scissors. So you would clamp and clamp, okay, with hemostats, and then you're going to cut in between with your scissors. That's going to help us to disconnect this baby from our placenta. So what I'm going to do, what I would do, is I'd bring my baby up to the chest, and I would put the baby right on mom's chest, like this. And my job, I would put a, bl a dry blanket, dry, dry blanket. So you need lots of new blankets, okay? So dad, stay here, okay. And you can be watching the baby, you know, keeping track of their vital signs and stuff. So now we still have a placenta, okay? The placenta should deliver pretty quickly, shouldn't take long than longer than 30 minutes. So remember, this is still clamped as well. So now our placenta will start to come. You should not have to be pulling on this, okay? You're just get, I mean, a little tiny tug, and out comes our placenta, okay? The placenta, like Nikki said, you can put it in a pan or wherever, but you should take that with you to the, to the hospital. Um, so at this point, she is shaking a little bit, yeah. Is she having a seizure now? You're, you're making me, you're, you're giving me complications. Uh, <laughs> my goodness, we're sticking to the normal here. Okay, so really big, this is an important point because remember, we're not done, okay? This is where your complications might get you. The hemorrhage after. This is where, you know, especially if this was a fast delivery, it does increase your risk for a hemorrhage. So what will happen is uterus way up here, now it should be at the belly button. This is where I'm expecting to find a uterus, at her belly button. So I should take one hand, support at like her pubic bone, okay? Take your other hand and massage right at the umbilicus, right there. That's where you should find it. It should feel just like a softball, like a grapefruit. You'll notice it, it's, it's hard to miss, okay? But you're supporting at the bottom because if you press too hard here without the support, you can actually invert the uterus and you don't want to do that. So just a little support and massage right there. And just keep massaging, okay? If it's not super firm, you want to massage until you feel it get firm and you should be kind of moving on your way to 
transport her to the hot her and the baby to the hospital at that point. Um, once it gets nice and firm, you can stop massaging, but you want to keep an eye on the bleeding. And then every couple minutes during the transport, continue to massage um, and make sure that it's still at you and it's still firm. Any questions on? on yes. Yeah. Like our shock protocol at that point, right? Legs up and yeah, I, I would think at, at this point there's not too much different, and I think that's a great point because a lot of times people think, oh, she's she's pregnant. At this point, you're doing the same exact thing, but the source of the bleeding is the fundus. So you do need to remember to keep even in all of that to keep massaging because until you can either get your ALS people there or get her to the hospital, she needs medications to help that uterus to contract. But what you can do is the massage of this baby to the breast, breastfeeding, those things will help to contract that. But the rest of the management of this is shock, so yes. Yep. Adrian, let them feel the baby because it's a weighted baby. Mm -hmm. and it, it feels very, it's very realistic as to what the baby will feel like. You want to feel the baby? Mm -hmm. that's, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you go. Good size. And, you have to support the head. Yeah, and... You do need to support the head, yes. But drying, stimulating, warm. That's your key. Massage that fundus, and that's really what you're focusing in on. Any other questions? Now there is, just so you know, um, one thing that we talked about was the cord clamp, so you should have that. I think that's in your, uh, yes, that's in your kit. So. Initially, the clamps are just hemostats, then cutting in between. But then you do want to go on to, to put a clamp on as well. And this should be like an inch from the baby's belly. Um, and that's really because, remember, this is the main artery to the baby. So if your hemostat were to come unhooked, bleeding would ensue. So you want to make sure that you've just kind of clamped that off. Yes. Yeah, I want to see. I just want to see what you have in here. So while we're while we're talking about that, so I have photo contempt. If you are not a faculty or student at Towson University and you're in some of these pictures, so in here it, it looks like you have this, you have this, and then it, it's giving you a scalpel. So it doesn't look well, like you have. Okay. So we're gonna tr discuss a little bit more. Um, a co some complications, okay? So one of the scenarios that um, was on one of your protocols was a shoulder dystocia. So what a shoulder dystocia is, is essentially, just like what it sounds like, a shoulder that is stuck, okay? This is a pretty, um, out of, of the complications, this I would think would be one that you may run into. A shoulder dystocia typically occurs in babies that are big, um, and we see this more often in moms that are, are, are diabetic, moms that are obese, okay? So I know we have an obesity epidemic of prana, so this could definitely be something that you run into. So we're going to just do like the nitty gritty on this. So what would happen is we, we would be like we were in the other room, like just awaiting our delivery. We saw crowning, the baby was there, and the head delivers, okay? This is not my high fidelity mannequin. <laughs> um, so the head delivers, and we're thinking, great, we're ready to go. You're waiting for the, the rest. And as you're sitting there, okay, we have our, let's have some helpers here for legs. I'm gonna come in, or you're gonna be the, here we go, the dad is here, okay? Okay, you're there. And we're awaiting, the, we're awaiting this delivery of the head. So we get there, and it's just, it's not coming, okay? So I'm waiting, so I suction the mouth and nose, thinking, okay, the rest of this baby should come. And what happens is they call it the turtle sign. The baby's head acts like it's going to come, and then it just kind of shrinks back in, okay? Um, and it just is not budging. So there's actually um, two maneuvers that are pretty basic maneuvers that I think you guys could all do that are in the protocol for this. And one is called McRoberts Maneuver, and essentially that is just having the mom, she is going to bring her legs back as far as she can, okay? 
So, um, because that mannequin doesn't do it, basically I can demo. So she's going to be grabbing onto her legs, but you're bring, they're fl you kind of bringing those legs as way back, and obviously you want as much space as possible because you need to try to open the pelvis as much as you can to get this baby out. McRoberts maneuver does it most of the time, okay? The next thing that you can do if the, if the baby is stuck there it would be super pubic pressure, but the thing that I need to um, say with this is you have, it's not fundal pressure. You are not pressing on her abdomen, okay? This is the fundus. Remember, the fundus is the top of the uterus. Super pubic pressure is just the pubic bone, okay? So essentially what that is doing is it's just, and nurses can do this, you know, we can, we can assist with this. So if you were in the field at someone's house and this is what was happening, first thing is just bring these legs back. I mean, that's giving you more space. Get as much space as you can. Have the partner help you. Make sure the mom knows that she needs to like really give a, give a push on this and it has to be really directed. And then you're gonna use just the heel of your hand right here at the pubic bone and just pressing straight down and that can help to relieve that. So then we could, this watch this baby, um, <laughs> don't do this on TV. Okay. <laughs> this is, then our baby should deliver, okay? So it's legs back, pressing straight down, okay? So, so we have our baby, but a couple things are going to occur now. If we have an issue with the shoulder dystocia, we have two concerns. This baby has now been trapped, most likely with not a lot of blood flow and oxygen because it was squeezed there and its umbilical cord was squeezed for several minutes. And now because we had this prolonged and protracted um, kind of second stage of labor, this pushing phase, the mom's uterus is going to, have, going to have a really hard time with clamping down. So now we have two issues. We just delivered this baby and that just almost gave us a heart attack. But now we have a baby that's not breathing or not moving around too much and we have a mom that's hemorrhaging. So we know that even when this was all going on, we should have been calling our backup because we always want lots of help. So hopefully they're going to get here any minute to help us deal with this. But in the meantime, we're stuck and we have to know what to do focusing on the baby and somebody needs to be really focused on controlling mom's bleeding. So in terms of the baby, we know that our initial steps are always dry, stimulate, warm and keep that up. Just dry, stimulate, warm. You're keeping that going because when you're stimulating that baby, hopefully we're going to get that baby to take respiratory efforts. Um, you should be assessing baby too, so assessing their respiratory re efforts, assessing their heart rate. If the baby use PPV, okay, so your bag mask, but you have to make sure you have the right size, okay? Don't have your peds one on there because it's not going to work. Make sure you have your um, neonate. Making sure they're warm, okay? Don't just have them laying wet out on the bathroom floor um, because you're not going to get the result you want of a baby being resuscitated if they are wet and um, they just will not re recess the way you want them to. So, have so who wants to come and recess the baby? <laughs> Nobody, nobody's jumping on that one. <laughs> give us a, give some, give us a, here we go. Okay, so we have our baby. We want to make sure they're dry, and you're going to give them some breath. Now, we, we know that they have a good heart rate. Their heart rate's decent, okay? So with that, we say one and two and three and breathe. 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 One and two and three. Breathe on three. So one and two and three and breathe. One and two and three and breathe. One and two and three and breathe. So you're looking to see, okay, is the baby starting to pink up? Are they starting to kind of fight you on this and make king some? So this baby, now you did that, starting to cry. So you can remove it off. Okay. Oh, the baby's doing good. Okay, so dry. Oh, <laughs> so we had a baby that now we resuscitated, but we need to keep monitoring this baby and keep them warm. We have mom that's bleeding here, okay? So the biggest thing with 
um, a postpartum issue is that most people dramatically underestimate the amount of blood someone has lost, okay? Um, yes, pregnancy is awesome because pregnancy accommodates for this bleeding, some bleeding, because by about midway through pregnancy, we have about 50% increase in our blood volume. But that is quickly uh, dissipated when we're having these hemorrhages. It is like oh, turning on a faucet and blood just coming out. So what you need to do in addition to getting your um, ALS helpers there and getting her to the hospital is you need to work to contract that uterus. So what you need to be doing is massaging the uterus. So you can put, we can put our legs down now. But Dad might be screaming because imagine if you saw imagine <laughs> if you saw all this blood, right? If you're yeah. in the house and you come in and there's this blood everywhere, that there might be or grandma, I know my mother would be way off the chart. She would be passed out, then you'd have another another patient. Um, and if that's the case, just tell them to go sit down. But you need to remember support underneath, and then you're going to massage. Okay? So Here's her belly button. We would expect it to be about at the level of her belly button and firm. And actually, I can feel one. She's got one. Okay. And you are you're pushing pretty. I mean, you're massaging pretty hard. You want this to be firm. If you go to massage and it feels boggy is the word we use, but like don't think like an IV bag. Okay. If it feels like that, that's no good. Keep going. And literally, so what you're doing is you're being the contraction. You're being the uterine contraction. So. So. A couple things. You won't necessarily expect more blood. You might the first time you go to do it because the uterus is hollow, right? So what is happening um, at a pathophysiologic level is that that placenta came away, okay? You got the placenta. It's somewhere around here. But what is left inside the uterus is all the big vessels, these big monster hose vessels were in there that fed the placenta. When the placenta goes away, those hose-like vessels are still just bleeding. So what the body does is it clamps the uterus down to make them, um, you know, stop bleeding. And eventually a scab is formed there. But if the uterus doesn't clamp down, the vessels don't clamp down. And you just get all that bleeding inside the uterus. So what will happen is it just kind of fills in there. It pulls inside the uterus. And then it can't contract. So you're pushing down. And yeah. Some might come out at first, but once you get it nice and contracted, it's not going to continue. It'll still ooze a little bit, but you're not going to get the big gushes. So continue to massage and get her to the hospital. Institute volume replacement. Um, so get two IVs if you can, because when we get to the hospital and she's blood like this, we're going to have to give her um, packed red blood cells and give her oxygen, get her flat. So just like your normal shock stuff that you would you would do. Any specific questions about anything I missed? Okay. Are, are there any other maneuvers that the McRoberts maneuver doesn't work and the pubic pressure doesn't work? Is there, there anything else in the field that you would can you repeat the question? So um, he asked if there are any other maneuvers that you could use if um, McRoberts and suprapubic pressure don't work. The other maneuvers are highly advanced and would not be something that I would say um, for you to do. I mean, they're done by providers who ha have like tons of training and, you know, what they do is they have to actually place the baby back inside using a certain maneuver and she goes um, it's, it, it's the baby most likely will have uh, it's an increased risk of actual fetal death obviously with this because the baby is not being perfused well but there's not really so much to be able to do. Uh, you can try different positions. You could try moving her from like maybe one side to the next to see if just keeping her legs back that might give a little bit more space but there's not there's not too much to do. At the hospital, we would just need to do a C-section, and even then, we would, be, we would be really strapped. It's one of those situations where we're like, we can't breathe for the whole amount of time that it, that it happens. You, yeah, you can try different positions. So you could try side to side. You could try getting her, you know, if you're at that point, then any position might help, because essentially, you just want a little bit more space there. So you could try flipping her over on the left side, you know, 
left side with top leg back really far. If the, if the delivery arrests and you're in that situation where you see the turtle sign mm -hmm. and you try the Roberts maneuver and you try to repeat the pressure and the head is, is still past the perineum um, and you're not making progress and now you're stepping on the gas and you're getting to the hospital as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. um, what can you be doing for the baby then and there? Can you, be, can you, do, do, do you advocate for trying to use the, the bag valve mask or do you just advocate for? Just get, I mean, we at the hospital, we would only proceed to cesarean section because in, inside, I mean, the baby hasn't taken its first breath yet. So it's a veal I have not opened. So trying to perform any type of resuscitative measures like bagging or anything like that isn't really going to do anything because it's still connected to mom. You know, um, it's one of those situations that is super scary. We hate it. Um, and we would simply, as the nurse, those are the things that we would be able to try. Just positioning, McRobert, suprapubic, and we would need a provider to get this any further. But you would have, you would have suctioned when the baby... Head, yes, uh-huh, yes, we would have, because we would have, we were, we're expecting normal, you're assuming normal delivery. You're assuming normal delivery. It's just, um, it arrests right there, and you can try, you, the, the goal is that we want to try to get that shoulder underneath. Um, at the hospital, like the doctor would try, sometimes they break the clavicle, sometimes they sweep the shoulder underneath. Um, but those are not things, I mean, my understanding from your protocols is that <laughs> you're not, you're not, right, you're not putting your hands in there. So really positional things are things you, you can try. You obviously would be calling the hospital and they may provide you with other specific things to do. But within your purview, it would, I, the legs back, and super pubic pressure and making sure the mom's well oxygenated. Remember our good oxygenation because that's helping perfuse the placenta better. But um, we just need to get advice from the hospital is what I would say. So I have a quick question about that. Because before we talk about neonatal centers, we're going to talk about perinatal centers. So is this one of those where you, you're going to drive by a local hospital that doesn't do any of those to go to, say, Sinai? Yeah, the closest place. Yeah, because we just need a C we need a C section is, is really what we need. I mean, every place that has a every place that has babies is prepared to do a cesarean section and prepared to resuscitate a baby. They may not be prepared to do ECMO or take care of preterm babies, but any place can do a C-section and every place is prepared. I mean, we all do like on labor deliveries, they all do drills for this. We do shoulder dystocia drills to see how fast we can move through this. And this isn't really by any fault of anyone. This just, this, this happens. Um, luckily, it's not super common, um, but it, it, is, it is something that happens. So just to clarify, we want to go with this specific instance, we want to go to the closest hospital, not the closest hospital that deals with anything baby related. Now, do though do when you say perinatal centers, are these just I mean I guess like Northwest for instance, they don't deliver babies. Correct. So you wouldn't want to go to Northwest. Okay. Thank you. you would want to go to a, a closest hospital that delivers a baby. <laughs> So that means that we would skip Northwest, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, the other thing, you know, we could be on a, we could be on a radio and the console is multiple places. And, and this is the issue. This is where we are. We want to go to the place else. And if we're directed to go someplace else, then that's what we could do. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is like one of those things where they're going to have to tell you what, what they can do. I mean, I, I'm sure every provider has at some point done a C-section, but it's not something that they, they want to be involved in if they don't need to be. So then I have another question. So your baby needs resuscitation, mom is bleeding out. Mm -hmm. Once your baby is recessed, uh, at least a little bit, would you recommend um, nursing to help stop the bleeding? If the, only if the mom is, I mean, if the mom is not up to it. I mean, in order for breastfeeding to occur, I mean, the mom has to be you know, be able to be alert and interactive with that. Um, so, and especially for a first time mom who has never breastfed before, that's not gonna come super easy for her. If this is a mom who's like having, th the perfect time for that is like a mom who it's her second baby, she's breastfed before and she's having a little more bleeding than you would like, 
just put that baby right up there. She's going to know just what to do. But if it's this situation, you need to stab you know, stabilize everybody before we get to that. Not to mention breastfeeding is not going to rectify a situation in a severe postpartum hemorrhage. That's a great question. Yeah. Breastfeeding doesn't stimulate. It does, and, it's, and definitely it's just like the best thing to do in, all, in, in any situation, like the, the true labor and delivery nurse, <laughs> just get the baby right up to the mom's chest and let them be together and be one happy family. And the thing about this is to know, like, this is, this is like a rare situation. You know, most of the time we're going to be like that situation out there. And even if you do have this, getting those legs back are really going to be like the key thing and in, in most situations just getting those legs back are going to be what really gets you it's not often that it's to the point of peril like that okay so let's summarize i always like a summary at the end okay so summary for this if you have a situation where the head delivers and the rest isn't get the legs back that's mick roberts legs back give you a lot of extra and tell that woman to give it the push like she's never had before that should do it for you, okay? You can use suprapubic pressure, but most likely the McRoberts, that's the legs way back, you know, is really gonna help you. Deliver the baby. With our baby, our priority are dry, stimulate, warm, okay? Looking for cr good crying. With our mom, our priority post-delivery is to massage the uterus, looking for a firm uterus like a grapefruit. It should be about at the umbilicus. Okay, if it's a little below, then hey, you're good, but you don't really want it above, but right at, you're good, okay? Massage, 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 assess your bleeding. The bleeding should look like, so what's the normal amount of bleeding? Maybe you were asking yourself, what's the normal amount of bleeding? Like, um, shouldn't saturate more than one maxi pad, not this pad, okay? An hour, so this is a lot. Okay, my students tend to sometimes not get that. Like they'll come in and they'll be like, oh, she just had some bleeding. And they're like calling the doctor. Oh, she's having some bleeding. If I see this, I'm very concerned. Okay, so then that, in terms of managing her, that goes into all the skills you already know in terms of managing patients who have lost blood. Except for, right, just add a massage to her fundus. Okay. So oxygenate with non-rebreather, left tilt, that's our big take home there. And postpartum, massage of fundus, dry stimulate and suction that baby. That's really what it all comes down to. <laughs> okay, any final questions? Can I tell you that what does ever be a situation, God forbid, where we have to separate mom and baby for like facility-wise? Mm -hmm. I, I would. It's like a trauma situation, like what if she needs to go to trauma and the baby I worked burn trauma and we would get burn pregnant patients okay. and um, the patient would be brought in and the baby would sometimes have to go some, like the baby once the patient was stabilized they would have to take the baby sometimes and then the baby would have to go somewhere else while we treated the burn patient in the burn center. Yeah. So that might be like more rare but it happens, it happens at our hospitals all the time. Like if you're delivering at, you know, uh, like a medical center, like we're delivering at St. Joe's and the, and the baby is, you know, <laughs> needs like a, you know, some kind of cardiac surgery immediately or like ECMO or like something. Already here. Yeah. Still yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it would be, and the one thing, and I'm not sure, this, this is a question for you, Nikki, like a big thing I know from a nursing standpoint in hospital is to make sure that we identify the baby do you, you know because now we're going to separate them they're not going to come together um how how do you well you would i would assume you'd register it under under the the mother baby girl whatever the mother's name is but i know we're really big on making sure that we have identification before they separate because now this baby who can't speak is going somewhere by itself so i'm not sure how do you uh, do you identify your adult patient Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of complications of delivery, people that, that have false pregnancy, but um, I, I think outside of mass casualty, mm -hmm. it's very hard to not reunify or identify which baby goes with which mother. Um, so I don't know that it's a huge concern, but we, we can always use this part of this character.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, because it, from a, from, and it's, that's just one of those things like we talked about before, like what's the difference between like the in-hospital stuff, like for us, we would, if, oh my gosh, if we let somebody out of that room without a bracelet on there, even if they're going to the NICU and they can't breathe, like we have to be bagging them and putting a bracelet on them at the same time. So what, whatever you think is appropriate for your uh, protocol. I might think of that situation where if mom needs to go someplace, and it might depend on where you are, and the baby needs to go to a place else, we might send the dad with the baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> or some partner, whoever's there, that can that can that can go with them. I think in both circumstances, you have to call and consult with both mm -hmm. receiving facilities. That way, they would know that you're separating them, and they'll probably tell you don't separate them. Or the, you know, they can choose whether or not to separate. Them. Remember, you call somebody else. So mom is going in one ambulance, probably, and the baby is going in another. Maybe. Yeah. Isn't that how protocols are born? <laughs> you can write that protocol. <laughs> right.